So I'm sure at some point, every one of us has seen some form of a talent show, whether it was at your high school, a community event, or even one of these TV shows like America's Got Talent. And every time I see a talent show, I'm amazed because I have no discernible talents. <laughs> and when I say that, I don't mean I'm bad at everything. I'm just bad at everything that anyone would want to see. <laughs> so until anybody wants to see somebody recite their multiplication tables or stand on one foot for three minutes, I am not going to be headlining too many talent show acts anytime soon. But despite that, I have participated in two talent shows. Now, the first time was at my elementary school when I performed and sang my rendition of the popular Miley Cyrus song, Party in the USA, <laughs> in front of about 800 people. But there were two problems. Number one, I can't sing. And number two, I didn't know that. <laughs> and about this point, if I were some motivational speaker, I would probably say something like, I don't regret this decision at all because I don't care what people think. Don't listen to peer pressure, kids. Hmm. But, but I did regret it because it was embarrassing. But I want to look a little bit deeper. What made this experience so bad for me? And so I thought and I realized, well, what I did made absolutely no sense because what I did could not have possibly led to what I wanted. What I wanted was for people to enjoy my performance. And what I did was do something I was bad at and expect people to somehow enjoy it. I set myself up for failure. And this was the first time I'd ever performed at a talent show, and I thought it'd be my last. But last year, I wanted another stab at things. And I thought, well, with my utter lack of talent, how is it even possible that I could not set myself up for failure? And despite that, I, I tried something. Has anyone ever heard of interpretive dance? <laughs> well, oops. It's this beautiful art form, and I wanted to try it. So I, I began asking my buddies, does anyone want to do interpretive dance with me? <laughs> and as can be expected, the response wasn't so great. But eventually I did, I did convince somebody to say, yeah, I, I guess I'll do it with you. And so we began to work on a little routine. And we actually came up with a little signature move and it went a little something like this. <laughs> and as you, as you can anticipate, the first time we practiced that, a bunch of kids gathered around and pointed and laughed. And literally, there's this one kid who ran up to us and he screamed at the top of his lungs, Bro, are you guys high or something? <laughs> and so, it was safe to say, that after that little fiasco, we knew we didn't have too much going for us. But we sat down and we thought, is there any possible way we could still maybe win this talent show? And so I thought back to that first time and what I did that first time and how I could avoid setting myself up for failure. The first time I did something I was bad at and expected people to enjoy it. And now we were faced with that same situation. We were very, very bad dancers, but we wanted people to enjoy our performance. You can see the problem there. But then I had an epiphany. Maybe for the, this was a talent show, but maybe, maybe our talent was our utter lack of talent. And what do I mean by this? Well, we were not gonna wow anyone with our dance moves anytime soon, but maybe we could make them so outrageous that people would laugh at how bad they were. So we called it comedic dance. We were very bad at dancing, but we were pretty good at making people laugh. And with that, we had just avoided setting ourselves up for failure because we were horrible dancers, but it no longer mattered because we were so horrible that people laughed. And when we performed, people did laugh. 
And we actually ended up winning second prize and $75. And it just so happened that one of the judges was so you think you can dance Canada winner, Jordan Clark. And I remember she came up to us after and she, she said, wow, that was awesome. That was so funny. We had just gotten a compliment about our dancing from the best dancer in Canada. And all by turning the tables on our weakness, being bad at dancing, and turning it into a strength. Now, although dancing is my greatest talent, I do do a few other things. When I was 14, about a year and a half ago, I founded Glowstick Social Marketing, a new media marketing firm run completely by high school students. I'd, I'd been interested in entrepreneurship for quite a while, but I didn't know what I wanted to do, and frankly, I didn't know what I could do. And so I decided I would apply the principles of interpretive dance to my creative process. And so I created a three-step process to come up with my business idea. First, I thought about what I liked and what I was passionate about. I'd been reading the mar marketing books since the sixth grade, and I just came back from winning an international marketing case competition. So I decided that I wanted to do something that would let me use marketing. Second, I thought about what other people thought I was good at. And to do that, I defined the first impression that the average adult would have of me if I walked up to them and said, sir, I want your money. And I decided probably they would say something like, you're a kid. And I was a kid, but what are the perceived strengths of a kid? And so I thought, and I thought, and I realized, well, I've been born in this digital age, and I've been immersed in technology for my whole life. And nobody could rob me of this durable competitive advantage simply because by being born when I was born, I inherently had it. So I knew that I knew way more about social media than the average adult, and I knew more about social media than the average business owner and the average marketing manager. And finally, I thought about what other people thought I was bad at. What were my perceived weaknesses? So I went back to that first impression, you're a kid. It was pretty easy to think of the perceived weaknesses of a kid. I knew that people would think that I and my team of high school students was too inexperienced, too naive to handle real work in projects. I was inexperienced, and I was naive. But then I thought about how I could turn this weakness into a strength. And so I realized, well, maybe in the realm of social media, being inexperienced is a good thing. Because being inexperienced means my mind was open, ready to innovate. My mind had not been indoctrinated with the old marketing principles that were simply outdated. My mind was ready to innovate shamelessly. And with this model under our feet, we were ready to run. And in April, I had the huge honor of being recognized as one of Profit Magazine's 30 Most Fabulous Canadian Entrepreneurs. I shared this honor with the likes of RIM founder Jim Balsley, um, NBA MVP Steve Nash, and the Dragons of the Dragon's Den, and all by turning the tables on my weaknesses. But the model was just the first sliver of the challenge. The rest of the challenge came in the execution. To talk about the execution, I want to skip back a few years to the heart of this great recession. Back in 2008, when this, this buzzword kept getting thrown around, and I was just in the sixth grade at the time, so I didn't, I didn't really know what it meant, but the buzzword was too big to fail. And it was used to describe these massive, massive companies that, were, that the government simply could not allow to fail. That this is not some macroeconomic thesis, so you don't have to fall asleep yet. Rather, I want to introduce you to a different concept. Too small to fail. Too small to fail. Too small to fail is not an economic principle. 
but rather it's a personal choice and a personal mindset. I've embraced too small to fail because I've embraced the fact that I am nothing, just another one in seven billion. Now, that sounds a little bit sad, but here's the fun part. When you embrace that you're nothing, you can't get any lower. <laughs> you can't become more nothing. You can only, only become more something. It's almost like playing a game of Texas Hold'em where, where you can win, pet, win bets and make bets without any chance of losing chips. And it's a little like being drunk. When you're drunk, you lose all perception of risks and punishment. You feel like you have nothing to lose. But it's not exactly like being drunk. When you embrace too small to fail, you still retain that judgment that says, don't jump off a cliff and... Don't invest your life savings that in some penny stock that a spammer told you to buy. You don't lose your common sense. Rather, you lose something else. You lose your pseudo common sense. Now let me introduce you to my good friend, pseudo common sense. What if I told you right now that the world you live in is completely fake? That your world is based on a complex hallucination that you have been indoctrinated with since birth. Well, I don't want to sound like some cult leader or conspiracy theorist, but it's true. You, your mind since birth has been injected with these false fears and false pressures that basically drive your life. Now, when we're all born, every human has this inherent desire to fit in. And there's nothing wrong with that. And our brains are programmed with this desire to fit in, but they're not programmed with that information of what to fit into. That information of what to fit into is what you're being indoctrinated with. We all know we don't want to be weird, but we don't know what weird is. Your definition of weird is your pseudosense. I had to drop my pseudosense to pursue my interpretive dance career, because in case you haven't noticed, interpretive dance is a little bit weird. And so I had to, I, I couldn't do it unless I dropped that pseudosense, dropped that fear of being weird. And I also had to drop my pseudosense to found glow stick. Because in consulting, needless to say, networking is huge. My first clients I met from networking events. And I remember I was, at, I was at this sleepover one time, and it was, at, it was at a friend's house, and I'm a morning person, so I was up early with about three hours of sleep, and I, would do, I was doing the natural thing that any teenager would do when his friends were asleep, and he had nothing to do. I went on my phone and checked Twitter. And so I was scrolling through these tweets, and suddenly I saw it. There was one tweet that read, Who's ready for our social media event for business owners happening today? And my eyes lit up. This is exactly who I'm targeting. Business owners who want to do more with social media. I gotta go. But then I looked down. I was wearing my pajama pants with moose heads all over them and a good old wrinkled white t-shirt. And I thought, hey, maybe I could ask my friends for something decent to wear, but they were all out cold, and the event was starting in two hours. It would take me at least an hour and a half to get downtown by public transit. And my pseudo sense, it was buzzing. It was telling me, Jerry, you can't do this. This is stupid. People are going to laugh at you. People are going to point at you. But then I realized my pseudo sense was just that. Pseudo-sense, false fears. And so I hopped on to the next bus downtown, and as I was walking into that event, as I was walking into that event, I could feel the stares of unimpressed old men on me. And in case you haven't noticed, in case you haven't experienced it, that's not the greatest feeling in the world. And I had my pajama pants on, my dirty old school backpack, and best of all, I had a sleeping bag slung on my right shoulder. 
but I did have my business cards with me. And it just so happened that an executive from LinkedIn was speaking at this event, and after it was all said and done, she was going to pack her bags to leave, and, um, and people were just letting her leave. But I, I wasn't about to let, people do, let her do that after coming all this way, dressed like this. So as all those hot shots and business suits and slick back hair were too afraid to just go up and talk to her, I went up to her, gave her a business card, and introduced myself. Hi, my name is Jerry Zhang, and I founded Glowstick Social Marketing, a new media marketing agency. And we ended up chatting for 15 minutes, and I learned a lot about social media, and I learned a lot about myself. I learned that from that moment on, I would never, ever listen to my pseudosense ever again. Now, I want to end this off with a question. What is an outlier? The dictionary definition is someone who stands apart from his or her group. But I actually want you all right now to think of who you think of, the name you think of when I say outlier, the first name that comes to your mind. And I'm going to give you five seconds, going to count to five, then I'm going to say koala. And once I say koala, I want you all to scream at the top of your lungs the name you thought of. Koala. Okay, so how many of you, probably a lot of you screamed out, well, not really screamed out, talked out, a celebrity, maybe your idol, maybe it was Mark Zuckerberg, Steve Jobs, Justin Bieber, whatever. So how many of you shouted out a celebrity? Put up your hands. All right, so not everyone shouted out a celebrity, but a lot of people think that celebrities are naturally outliers, that you have to be a celebrity to be an outlier. Well, why is this? Why not? Why can't you scream out your quirky uncle or funny eighth grade teacher or really friendly neighbor? Well, because society has added this extra layer of romanticism to the definition of outlier. An outlier is now somebody who most of society perceives to stand apart from his or her group. But this is not true. You don't become an outlier when you accomplish something great and somebody runs up to you and says, wow, you're an outlier. <laughs> and you don't become an outlier when you accomplish this great feat. You become an outlier when you make the conscious choice to take your situation and take a different approach to it. You become an outlier when you decide that you're going to drop your pseudosense, embrace too small to fail, and just jump in, whether you fail or succeed. I had to drop my pseudosense and embrace too small to fail to found Glowstick, meet that lady from LinkedIn, and do interpretive dance. I hope you have all taken something from my presentation today, and it can start right here. After this presentation, come up to me, talk to me, ask me anything, or ask me for anything, because you never know what could happen. Thank you.